Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. To all of my returning subscribers, hey, how you doing? And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome, kick your feet up as I give a full recap of the 90 Day Fiance Before the 90 Days, season four, episode 12, entitled King of Wishful Thinking. And the title is so appropriate. That's all coming up next. It's Bunny. pick up right where the last episode left off with Jeffrey asking Varya to marry him and she feels really strange she's giving long pauses and she doesn't want to just give an answer based on emotion but she wants to try to answer this as best as she can because she's really taking her time in answering she tells him you're an amazing guy you're great you're awesome we've had fun while you've been here but I'm not ready and I'm not saying no but not yet she still feels like she doesn't trust him and that everything is moving too quickly and of course he's heartbroken he says that that is the reason why I came here I had the understanding that we were getting to know each other and this would be the next step in our relationship but with the news about his criminal past she's not really feeling 100% willing to jump in just yet we also pick up where the last scene left off with Ash and Avery. He's throwing his tantrum, he's threatening to leave, and he finally comes back and tells Avery that if you want to make this work, you need to tell me. You need to tell me right here and right now that you love me. And Avery is still in shock that he's throwing this tantrum, and this is a side of him that she's never seen before. And she says that I'm trying to speak with you and I'm trying to understand where you're coming from but you walk off every time if you feel that you're threatened if you feel that I'm not supporting you how can I really go there so far as feeling that I can be in your corner when you approach me and say that I'm a bad and harsh person it's really hard to kind of stand with you when you do that he apologizes and says that in that moment he was very crushed and he didn't feel like she was in his corner but he understands that he must calm down and move forward because they have scheduled to speak with his ex-wife and for her to meet his son. And they have a two-hour drive to get to that point. We hear a narrative how Ash was divorced almost 10 years ago and he has split custody of his son. So Avery finds it very important that she needs to speak with the ex-wife because he does have a child involved and that would mean uprooting his foundation and coming to the States. As they're driving, Avery wants him to know that, hey, I want a separate hotel room and I really need to be by myself. Ash doesn't think that's necessary and she has limited time with him and that they should room together, but she's too upset. She needs to collect her thoughts and he respects her wishes. Erica and Stephanie, they continue to move forward and Stephanie wants to introduce introduce Erica to her mom and Steph decides to Skype call her mom to have a talk because she was going to have a talk with her anyway and she wants to include Erica in this conversation. She wants to try to come out and talk to her mother and Erica is ready. Erica is ready for this same process and she sits there with her. As she calls her mom, her mom is looking very suspicious about her friendship and who's sitting next to her. And Stephanie says, you know what, mom, I really have a confession to make. And the mother says, okay, what is this confession? And Stephanie pauses a moment and says, I went shark diving. And she chickens out and doesn't say the true entity of what she was going to say concerning the call. And the mother goes, oh, you've got to be more conservative. You can't do that. That's really dangerous. 
and Erica looks upset and disappointed. They close the call, and Erica, you can see it in her face, you can see it in her body language that she's upset, but Stephanie says that you were at a different point in your life with speaking with your parents, but it's going to be a little bit more different for me because my mother's really conservative, and I don't want to mess up the relationship between my mom and I, but Erica is saying that I can't wait on you forever and you've got to really pick up the pace with something because I don't want to feel like a secret. David, he wants to go back to Ukraine to make this fifth and final attempt to see Lana. He feels that even though she stood him up several times, that his destiny is her and he wants to marry her and he wants to propose to her and have that moment. He doesn't have any proof of a meeting time, a place, but he feels that she's being honest and will meet up with him. He arrives at the hotel and even the hotel concierge thinks it's very odd that he's meeting with his girlfriend because he makes that evident when he reaches the counter. I'm here to meet my girlfriend. We've been dating for seven years, but I've never seen her. When producers talk to the concierge employee, she says that I don't think this is real. I don't think the relationship is real. Unfortunately, Women from Ukraine do a lot of online scamming, especially with a lot of American men. He goes to his room and he checks his messages and says, oh man, I've mess missed a message from Lana. And she's telling me that I have a, my nephew's hockey game to go to and he she can't see him. And once again, David feels completely defeated and upset. And he expresses that I made her my priority and I don't think it's fair that she's making the, ho the hockey game a priority over me. Ed and Rose, they're still sitting in that scene and Rose is telling him that I'm done. I've given you chance after chance after chance and your actions aren't acceptable. I don't like your behavior. You don't even try to connect with my son. And Ed tries to give this pity speech about he, how he was going to propose. He fell in love with her over Facebook and he came all that way to see her and she's not feeling it. She's saying that, you know, wow, you're not even taking accountability. And it's like, what I said went in one ear and out the other, basically. She's not having it. She just says, I'm done. It's always about you and it's exhausting. I always am embarrassed about things that you say about me. I don't want a relationship with you. And she says, I'm done. And she even says that beware of your behavior with the next woman and how you treat her. And Ed tries to throw a it's all about me speech again by saying, so I'm a bad person. You're telling me I'm a bad person. And Rose is sick of the BS and doesn't play into it and says, yes. And Ed gets up and storms away. And you can see that Rose is over it. She doesn't try to catch him. She just lets him walk away. And she goes back to the room to pack her things. And she's saying that I'm going to wait on another uh, flight um, I'm out of here. I'm done with this relationship. And we see her packing her things and leaving for the airport. And Ed says that maybe she needs some time and he goes by the pool to think and to cool off. He's saying that I can't listen to her speak anymore because every time she speaks, it makes me sad and it makes me angry, but she's completely done. And we do see her leaving. Ash and Avery, they meet with his ex-wife and son and his ex-wife's name is Sion. And she sees that they have chemistry, but she does know to production that she can also feel that there's some tension in the room. It seems that his ex-wife is very welcoming to Avery, and she even offers a nice hot cup of coffee and asks her if she's hungry and would like to get a bite to eat. And Avery sees how the interaction is positive, and even the son makes a few jokes about a pet cat, and she sees the family dog, and they all seem like they're getting along. But Ash says to production that he's worried about what his ex-wife will say to Avery in their one-on-one -on -one conversation. But they leave so they can sit down, have lunch, and talk. Jeffrey feels sad, and he's so upset that she's declined the offer um, with his proposal and 
He's just over it. And they leave to get ready to go to Mo Moscow so he can head back to the States. And as they're talking on the way to the airport, Jeffrey says, you know, it was awkward when I got here coming from the airport and it's awkward with me leaving. And she says, I don't want to tell him a, a yes answer and then later regret it. I don't want to rush into everything. And as they're driving, she sees a bar and says, oh, there's a nice bar. We should go there next time. And he's telling her, well, why would I come back here? You told me no, so why continue to waste my time? It's not like you're right down the street. Erica and Stephanie, they hang out with her friends again because to Erica, her friends are everything. She hangs with them all of the time and she wants to have a redo with her friends and to show them that, hey, Stephanie is a wonderful person to me and I really want you guys to work it out. But when Stephanie arrives into the room, of course, there's this weird energy and everybody's really uncomfortable because remember, from the last meetup, there was an argument. But her friend makes up a game. He picks up a game for them to play called Privacy. And Erica thinks that he's just starting up some trouble and wants to get a reaction out of Stephanie. And Erica asks Stephanie, hey, Pinky, swear that you'll keep it cool and this is a game and you're going to stay calm. And Stephanie says to her, look, I'll try my best. I'm not making any promises. There's some walls that are up emotionally and they feel uncomfortable at first. But after a while, Steph says that after they're playing the game, she notices that all of her friends weren't judgmental and that they all just want to have fun. And now she understands why Erica likes them so much. And then Stephanie goes back to the hotel to pack and talk about packing up for the States and moving forward. David arranges for a translator because he wants to speak directly to the private investigator that he used before face to face. It seems that he might have had some reservations about his friend's wife being the translator. Maybe he felt that she wasn't giving him the real information from the private investigator. When they get there, the investigator remembers Dave's case because of his research that proved that this female was potentially a crook. So even the translator can sense that this quote-unquote girlfriend is suspicious. The investigator says that you don't realize she's apparently scamming you. It's a game and all of the documentation was sent to you showing that she has not only several different accounts, but she's been speaking with several different other men, including you. Dave gets very defensive and tells the man that no, that's not it. That's not correct. And he gets so mad that he says that you're fired and storms off. But this makes the translator feel very uncomfortable, but she still translates and says that he will no longer be needing the services and that he's fired. Speaking to the production, the investigator says that he's used to that reaction from people because people pay him to get info that they want. But once they get the truth, they get upset. So we have Sian and Avery. They sit down to have their conversation and Sian is very welcoming and she's very positive and she says to her that he is a very good person. He's always trying to find the silver lining in everything and I don't feel that you should have anything to worry about. And Avery asks that can he be trusted and Sian says yes, he can be trusted. He's a very different person now than when he was when I was with him. I will say that it seems like it took me forever for him to talk about his feelings because he was very standoffish and that became very frustrating. And on top of that, when we had the baby, it made the communication even worse. And she says that it's just something that he's learned to get better with. And I don't think you should have an issue with him since they did just divorce only a year ago. And Avery is just like, whoa, only a year ago? What do you mean? I thought you guys got divorced 10 years ago. And Sian says, no, we got divorced a year ago. Is everything okay? And Avery describes that that's really strange and 
I, we were talking around that time and Sia says, oh no, we officially divorced a year ago, but we've been separated for a very long time. And there wasn't any urgency because it was pretty amicable and we didn't want to complicate things. And they share a breather because Sion saw that she was concerned and Avery saw that she was concerned. And Avery says, you know, I know that it's already settled and you guys are not together anymore, but I just wonder why Ash didn't tell me such important details since we're moving to the States. Speaking of the States, I wanted to talk to you about the situation concerning your son because he's thinking about moving to the States with me. Can you tell me your opinion about that? And Sian does explain, explain that she does disagree and felt really, really sad about her son leaving because that is her child and her child is top priority. He's at the age where he needs his father all the time, always around him as much as possible. And it would be difficult for her to have her son so far away. And then if not moving to the States, being all the way in his homeland far away. And Avery is very understanding to that. And she says that, wow, Ash painted it as if she was very fine with it and very cool with it. But she understood that that comment really didn't seem correct because she's a mother herself and she understands how a mother would feel with her child being so far away. Sian says, thank you for being so understanding and thank you for telling me that. That eases my emotions much more knowing that you understand how I feel. Jeffrey is going to the airport and he says that he's just done. He feels really, really sad that she turned down the proposal and he's learning that he just needs to go home and start over. He's obviously upset. And she's saying to him, I don't want to rush things. I don't want things to feel awkward. And I don't want to say yes just because you think I should say yes. And he gives her a hug and he's very cold and he's saying that I'm done and this was a good adventure and bye. And he walks into the airport in order to start getting everything prepared for his flight. And she's outside confused in tears saying, I don't want things to end between us two. I just don't want to get married right now. I just don't want to rush it. And she goes into this conflicted stance of, man, what, what, what should I do now? She goes back into the airport and requests another hug and says, I just want you to know, I don't want this to be over. I'm letting it be known that I don't want it to be over. But he's over it. He's telling her, look, I'm not coming back. Ever. I feel that once you turn down my proposal, that's letting me know where we stand. So goodbye, and I hope everything works out for you. Stephanie and Erica, Steph has two more days before she goes back to the States, and they have some pillow talk in the morning. And Erica's very understanding that it's going to take Steph some time to come out, but at the same time, she wants to make it known that I don't want to wait forever, and I don't want to seem like a secret forever and I'm putting a lot on the line because this has happened to me before and Stephanie says well what do you mean it's happened to you before and she says well I had something similar with someone in relationship that was 10 years on and off and it didn't work out because she couldn't come out and she made me feel like a secret and Stephanie gets very upset and says that I thought we were honest. I thought you told me everything in your past and you're just upsetting me because every time you talk to me, it's something new. And Erica says that you tell me new things about your past relationships all the time. And I never get upset because it's in your past. Why are you upset? And Stephanie gets so upset. She tells her to leave and throws a plate and storms out. And she tells her to leave. And Erica is left in tears sitting in the bed. And she says, I'm tired of her yelling at me. I'm tired of her going off on everything that I feel is important for us to communicate about. She always tells me everything with her. But every time I tell her something about me, it's like I'm painted as this monster and that I've done something wrong. Stephanie comes back into the room. She gathers her emotions. She calms down and she's like, I shouldn't have thrown the plate. I'm sorry, but I just feel that you're just not honest with me and you t you're telling me this. And Erica says, that's the point. We're getting to know each other. There are no secrets. And I felt that I didn't need to tell you that because at that time, there was no point in me telling you. We were still getting to know one another. 
and she tells Erica that I'm done and this relationship is over. She doesn't even console her or give her a hug or anything. Stephanie is being really harsh and really cold to her. And Erica packs up her things. And as she's walking to the car, we hear her voiceover production talk. And she's saying that I don't understand. Ever since she's been here, I've done any and everything. Any and everything to make this work. And every little thing upsets her. And now I'm the one that's being broken up with. And I don't get it. I don't understand. David is still convinced that he's not being scammed. He gets ready to meet up with her at a specific location at a specific time, 11 o'clock. He doesn't have any proof that she'll show up. He just has hope that she's going to propose, that he's going to show up and he's going to propose. He's in complete denial and he's just hoping that everything works out. And he says the first time she didn't meet, didn't meet up with me, she was shy. The second time she told me her brother died. The third time she had surgery and had a medical operation and she was out of it for, for some days. The fourth time she got cold feet. And I feel that this fifth time is hopefully a charm. So he's waiting by a statue in a particular area and he's waiting and he's waiting and he's saying that it's been over seven years and I'm ready to meet her and what we have is true and this is a real relationship. Time goes on, it's 11, now it's 11.07 and it's still time going on. And as he's looking, he's like, is that her? Hmm. No, that's not her. Some more time passes and he says, is that her? And we're looking, and as a viewer, we don't see anyone, but he sees someone. And he says, oh, that is her. And we see a smile on his face. And to our surprise, it's her. She showed up. And I think everybody that showed this, <laughs> that saw this episode was like, what? It's her, people. She showed up. And I was on the couch floored in complete shock that this person was real. And that was the end of the episode. Now, do you feel that even though she's real and she's a real person, do you think that she's a scammer? Because they did have evidence that she had several different accounts and she was talking to several different men. Do you think she'll use this opportunity to continue to use David for funding? Do you think that there's real love there? When it comes to Stephanie and Erica, it's something about Stephanie that's pretty fishy. It doesn't seem like she's really understanding about her feelings, as Erica did mention in the argument, that that are you really sure that you're bisexual? I don't know. Does she have cold feet to tell her mom? Or do you guys really think that she's bisexual? I really think that Ash and Avery pot potentially might not work because there are children involved. And uprooting children from that foundation is very, very shaky and very rough because you really have to be de delicate when it comes to children. And you have to consider their feelings. And also, would the child be able to be away from his mother for long periods of time being so far away? It's a really delicate situation. Now, when it comes to Jeffrey... I first thought, wow, he's being kind of cold to her after the proposal. And she's not saying no. She's just saying not now. But then after thinking about it, I get why he's done. Because let's just say hypothetically, they do try to continue with the relationship and they try to make things work. Um, It would be awkward because then how does he know when to propose again or what to do? And it would just be kind of weird. Let me know what you think about that. When it comes to Rose and Ed, oh my goodness, Ed, he really thought he had it in the bag because she was poor and because she didn't have money. And he thought that, wow, she could be using me. But at the same time, it goes to prove that just because you have um 
money doesn't automatically give you class. It doesn't automatically give you the ticket on how to treat people well. For her not to be in the same financial situation, she knows about respect, she knows about loyalty, she knows about honesty, and she does a very good job. Even though she doesn't speak English well, she does a very good job in communicating how she feels and being honest. I don't think it was fair that Ed behaved the way that he did throughout what we've seen documented on this show. He's always had demands that respectfully should have been in private. Things about her shaving le her legs, things about where she lived, just everything, just continuous complaining and requests from Ed. That was just really, really awkward. And I could see why she got very, very frustrated. She didn't want to deal with that because she did give him chance after chance after chance. And his concerns were conversations, once again, that he should have had in private. And he just embarrassed her. And she was just done. So I can understand why she's over it. Let me know what you think. Subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any post. And also follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, officialbun underscore E. Check out those playlists so you don't miss any good shows and recaps. You guys, there's plenty to watch. Until next time, bye.